Thanks very much, and uh, good morning to, to everyone. Before I, uh, I start, um, I actually want to recognize, I think, on behalf of all of us, uh, Nikolai's contributions. He spent a lot of time over the last day and a half thanking everyone, but I actually don't think any of us would be here uh, if uh, a young person in the middle of a COVID lockdown when no one was traveling at all and we had zero visibility into what we were going to do later on, had the, the vision and the tenacity and enthusiasm for organizing a meeting like this. So Nikolai, to your great credit, thank you very much. So I, I have to try and you know tell you something new and after Jens uh, and then Rachel, the, the, the window is getting smaller for, for new information. So, um, you know, I work at the Lunenfeld Tenenbaum Research Institute, and what some of you may not know, my only opportunity to tell you something new, is that Larry Tenenbaum may be the only benefactor that has funded not only an internationally important research institute, but has hosted the Larry O'Brien Trophy as the owner of the Toronto Raptors for winning the NBA championship. So when you leave here, and many of you will say in the coffee break, I didn't learn anything from Drucker's lecture, but that one thing I think will perhaps keep you going. So I have some uh, current uh, disclosures to make. These are some of the people we interact with uh, for our research support. And I'm gonna, again, simply divide this up into glucagon, you know, should we activate this or should we uh, block this, and uh, I think you've already gotten the, the sense that activating may be more feasible and, and more effective therapeutically than blocking, although, you know, there's always the possibility that there is a, a therapeutic window, but let's take a look and see how it goes, and, and certainly these are liabilities that uh, I think are difficult to escape, and, you know, throughout the almost four decades that we've been looking at therapeutic opportunities, you know, I have often been called, in fact, I think Rudy Libel in New York first called me, you know, the Woody Allen of diabetes. And that can be a little sketchy because his behavior is not always, you know, uh, above board. But what it means, he, I think he meant like this short, anxious Jewish guy, hair receding, who worries a lot about what might happen in terms of safety. And those are the characteristics that I apply to this as well. So I, I think this approach, and I've just picked one molecule here because I know many of you are going to go into greater depth on multi-agonists, but this is more recent data, a collaboration uh, with Eli Lilly, and I think this shows, you know, the combination of making oxyntomodulin better and unimolecular glucagon GLP-1 agonists, and this, I think, is ultimately going to prevail. And there are multiple molecules that have glucagon as a component in the clinic now. Some of them are already showing, you know, 10 plus percent weight loss. So if you have to leave now, this is uh, where I think the money is going to be uh, therapeutically. Now, how does this work? And, you know, we know that glucagon can talk to the brain and control appetite centers. There's always been interest in animals about the energy expenditure piece that we've heard about. If one takes a look and says, is there glucagon in, in white adipose tissue or in brown adipose tissue? The answer is yes, but that's tissue and not necessarily adipocytes. And so one can get bogged down in the details of how one interprets this data. You can take adipose tissue cells out and manipulate glucagon receptor gene expression, either by knocking it down or by giving glucagon, you see the data here, and, and you can easily see very nice like effects directly of glucagon on adipocyte-like cells. You can do the same types of experiments and show the same direct effects of GIP ex vivo on adipocyte-like cells, and almost the same type of effects with GLP-1 ex vivo on differentiated adipocyte-like cells. But the reality is, as I'll show you, normal adipocytes in vivo basically do not express this receptor. So one has to be very careful about this. Now, again, the animal data is very compelling about glucagon and energy expenditure. And, you know, Tumo, I know you're going to show more data about this. 
And what we can see is no matter what temperature we house the mice at, very cold, very warm, thermoneutral, et cetera, we always see that glucagon can increase energy expenditure. Regular chow diet, high fat diet always works. But it's not a simple BAT or browning mechanism. It, it involves other tissues. And you know, here we can take out UCP1. There's still a thermogenic effect of glucagon. We can take out FGF21. There's still a thermogenic effect. So this is a much more complicated mechanism than simply a, a reductionist single pathway approach. But of course, these are mice. And a huge question that we hope will be answered over the next year or two is, will this be relevant to humans? Will we be able to somehow recruit a component of thermogenesis in humans that will prevent some of the you know, tendency to resist weight loss? It doesn't have to be as great an effect as it is in mice. Um, we know that single injections, Steve Bloom has shown that single injections of oxyntermodulin will increase you know, VO2 in humans, but again, it doesn't seem to be a, a BAT-like activity. When he does the PET scans, those superclicker fat pads are not letting up. So whether it's liver or other tissues, still more work to do. Now, some of the data in the field for the glucagon receptor knockout mice is, is quite um, conflicting, I would say. If you look at the original data from Merck, uh, Susan Connerello and Bay Zhang said, oh, glucagon receptor knockout mice are protected from high fat feeding, their liver is healthier, everything metabolically about them is beneficial, and so they were very excited to put that antagonist that Yen showed you into the clinic. Well, we were doing the same experiments, and we didn't see any of the same benefits that the Merck people did, and we would have advisor boards, and you know, Bei Zhang would look at me with you know, an evil uh, glare, et cetera, and we, you know, I said, well, let's see what happens to your antagonist. Now, one of the reasons that we weren't seeing, I think, many of the metabolic effects is, as I mentioned, if you actually look at RNA-seq, and this is data now from multiple labs independently and often single nuclear RNA-seq, we just don't see this class B GPC receptor family in most adipocyte depots. So, you know, you can never always rule out that there isn't one adipocyte somewhere in some depot that somebody hasn't looked at in some animal under some conditions. So, but at least availability, the field does not really see this. And this was, you know, somewhat gratifying to John Campbell, who, you know, had engaged a, a lawyer to represent him because one of the projects I gave him was to knock out the G, you know, adipocyte GIP receptor, and he tried for about seven years with multiple different Cree constructs, could never do it because it wasn't there. So that was, uh, John and I are settling this amicably now, so it, it, it'll all work out. So what about the heart? You're not going to hear much about the heart during this meeting. I looked at all the abstracts, and we know that having cardiovascular safety is a minimum for drug development for chronic use and cardiometabolic disease. And there are actually patents filed by some of our colleagues that say if you block glucagon action, you will have a protective effect on the heart. Uh, and, and that's true because we had shown many years ago that there was detectable glucagon receptor expression in the mice, uh, both in the ventricles as well as in the atrium. And you can see this is compared here relative to the other class B GP receptors. And when uh, Safina Ali and John Usher said, well, how important is glucagon in the heart? If you give glucagon to a mouse at the time of an experimental myocardial infarction, the mice die. So it's really important, and it's not good to activate cardiac glucagon activity in the context of experimental ischemia. And we could block this effect with a, a MAP kinase inhibitor. Now, you know, how does this work? There are actually signaling pathways directly activated by glucagon in the heart that impair survival that are, are quite deleterious. And many of the older folks know that for a few years, because of the chronotropic, inotropic effects of glucagon, it was actually pursued as a treatment for heart failure. And if you actually look in the prescribing information for glucagon, you'll see that it can be used like one dose for acute shock, right? Catecholamine refractory shock is an indication for glucagon, but it generally stops working and probably is not helpful 
uh, at least chronically, but not for the reasons that we think of from mice. So was, was this a direct cardiac GCGR effect, or was this indirect from uh, other things going on? So we can knock out the glucagon receptor from mice, and when we actually do that and say, what happens now to mice who are getting myocardial infarction, uh, if they have no cardiac glucagon receptor, they actually do better. So you take away that receptor, which when activated is harmful, you take it away, and now the mice don't die. They have improved ventricular function, smaller infarcts, and are much happier that they don't have the cardiac glucagon receptor. Well, you know, does this, you know, really explain what was going on when we gave glucagon and killed the mice? So here again, we gave glucagon to the controls, and at the bottom you can see the mice are dying. But if you give glucagon to the cardiac glucagon receptor knockouts, they have glucagon receptors everywhere else, just not in the heart, they no longer die. Okay, so this is really a direct effect in mice where manipulating glucagon receptor signaling, activating it is bad, removing it is beneficial. So that's fine. You put that on your risk of you know, benefits and, and limitations for developing these drugs for mice, for mice. When you look at humans, you don't see glucagon receptor in the human ventricles. And this is like so annoying if you're developing drugs for mice um, because the human people will be distracted, okay? Um, but if you're developing drugs for humans, you, you need to look at the mouse data and say, that's nice, Drucker. You know, you just go ahead and do your mouse experiments, but this may not be relevant. And so, you know, the, why would you file a patent application to use glucagon receptor signaling to protect human cardiovascular disease when the biology is so different? I obviously don't know the answer to that question because I didn't file the patent application. So you look, you say, well, that's just crude, uh, you know, biobank specimens that we analyzed in our lab from about 18 different human hearts at Penn, you can find the exact same data when you look in an unbiased manner in published human cardiac RNA-seq. And you can see if there was some GCGR in the heart, you would see at least a few little dots somewhere. It's not there, okay? So again, we haven't looked at 10,000 hearts. I, I can't say to you that under some pathological conditions, the glucagon receptor might not appear, et cetera. But we have looked at RNA-seq from both normal hearts and ischemic hearts, and it's not there, okay? So there's a huge species-specific biology with respect to understanding what this does. And we don't have a lot of data in the context of cardiovascular disease with these new coagonists. So, Although we're confident about what the GLP-1 component will do, there's a bit of a uncertainty. You know, glucagon does increase heart rate. I'm not going to go over that. And some of the increase in heart rate with the human drugs has been quite prominent, at least in the short-term study. So I think we, we need more work uh, in this area. But where I think we have uh, a greater mechanism-based liability, as we've already sort of seen to some extent, is in this area. Now, obviously, the rationale for inhibiting glucagon signaling in the context of, of diabetes is tremendously powerful. And we've already heard this very nicely from, from Jens and from Rachel Perry. So it makes 100% sense to, you know, try and take down some of this excess hepatic glucose production. And then the question will be, well, how effective is this? And, you know, we already have a lot of drugs that do this, right? So, you know, although the field was trying to develop more powerful glucagon receptor antagonists, you know, pramlantide that's approved in the United States, very powerful inhibitor of glucagon in humans. DP4 inhibitors that are approved worldwide, very powerful inhibitors of glucagon in humans. You know, the drugs that we like uh, in Toronto and Copenhagen, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, very effective inhibition of excess glucagon in humans with diabetes. Now, I'm showing this for you, Jens, because this data 
is more complicated. So Urs Meyer and Michael Nauck and Jens and maybe some of you here have shown that GLP-2 actually increases glucagon in the context of a meal. And, and we may discuss some of these mechanisms more because we're going to be talking about amino acids, et cetera. But this is you know, interesting because we've looked at this quite a lot. And using multiple techniques, good old RNA isolation from islets, looking at single cell RNA-seq, we never see the GLP-2 receptor in alpha cells or in islets. And if we either incubate islets with GLP-2, we don't see an increase, and we can never get glucagon going up with GLP-2. But I have 100% confidence that this data that I'm showing you is correct. And so how do we put this all together? And, and even human data like this that's showing if you do the experiment a, a different way without giving people a, a meal, then you don't see an increase in glucagon. And so one of the things that we know happens with meals is amino acids, you know, uh, are going up. And why might that be? You know, there's a connection between glucagon and GLP-2 and amino acids. And, you know, I think we need more work to understand th this whole story. But I don't think it's a direct effect on the islets. So can we find a window to further block glucagon action in the liver even though all the drugs that I've shown you that are clinically approved already are reducing glucagon, sometimes by 30, 40, 50%, is there still a window to take the signaling down at the liver lower and get a therapeutic effect? And, and I think threading that needle, finding that therapeutic window is extremely difficult. Now, why would you want to do it? So Jens showed you some of the, this data. So this data for the Merck glucagon receptor antagonist, notice that this is head-to-head -head here against metformin. Metformin's a really powerful drug. The glucagon receptor antagonist that Merck had was way better than metformin. So this, if it had made it all the way, would have been the most powerful oral agent that we had ever seen for type 2 diabetes. However, we saw these mechanism-based toxicities. So, you know, here are some of the transaminase levels. Here's the ALT in the same subjects with the same doses. And there's sort of a nice dose-dependent increase in transaminases with these drugs. Here is LDL cholesterol with the same drugs in the same patients, a nice dose-dependent increase in LDL cholesterol. And for the people who are just joining the metabolism community, that's a bad thing to happen, okay? It's like not good to have your LDL cholesterol go up when you're treating somebody with diabetes. Now, this was not a surprise to us at all because, you know, many years before, Christine Longuet in my lab had basically studied what does activating glucagon in the liver or taking away glucagon in the liver do. In fact, for those of you who work on a dairy farm, anybody grow up on a dairy farm here? Don't be shy. It's Copenhagen. There's pigs and cows and stuff. No? Okay, so, so farmers use injections of glucagon to clear fat from the liver of animals. This is in the literature decades ago, and you can show the same thing in mice. You can get rid of the liver in uh, mice by injecting glucagon, and this is a very robust effect. And you can also basically have a, a very profound change in the panel of enzymes that are important for either lipid synthesis or lipid oxidation. As, as Rachel Perry showed you in her paper from a few years ago, this is very well known that glucagon in the liver has profound effects not just on glucose metabolism, not just on amino acid metabolism, and we'll hear more about that especially tomorrow, but also on the genes that control lipid oxidation. And you get the beautiful mirroring. If, if you give glucagon, the genes go one way. If you take away the glucagon receptor, the pattern reverses. So this is real biology from both gain and loss of function. So as a consequence, you would predict that disrupting the glucagon receptor in the liver is going to place your liver at risk. And unlike the paper from Merck, from Conorello and Bei Zhang, where they said glucagon receptor knockout mice are protected from hepatosteatosis, 
every experiment we did showed the exact opposite in our lab. So, you know, we put mice on a high fat diet, the, the mice get full of uh, fat in their liver very quickly and it's very obvious. If we say, well, let's try a different diet, maybe that was just some freaky high fat diet in the Drucker lab, let's put them on a methionine-choline deficient diet, the glucagon receptor knockout livers do much worse. Well, what if we say, okay, those are funky diets, let's just injure the liver using a totally different mechanism and a totally different pathway by activating fast cell, the glucagon receptor knockouts die more and their livers look terrible. So no matter what intervention we did, if you don't have glucagon receptor in the liver, your liver is at risk for both metabolic and non-metabolic injury. And we could do the opposite experiment. So instead of saying you do worse if you take away the glucagon receptor, if you do the same experiment by injecting glucagon and then the fast cell activator, you protect the liver from liver injury. And in fact, some of you, anybody here done a liver transplantation? Oh, come on, don't be shy, no? So in the old preservative, when they were getting the liver, taking it from one person to the other, they would often put glucagon in the fluid surrounding the liver to protect the liver. So this has been known for years that glucagon is hepatoprotective. Now, Yen showed you the data from this uh, paper in Nature Medicine. People are still trying to say, well, there must be some place I can use a glucagon receptor antagonist to, to get the benefits without the liabilities. And this was the type 1 diabetes study. And there were small benefits. You know, there was a little bit of a reduction in A1C and a little bit of a, a reduction in mean glucose and time and range. But again, you cannot escape the adverse events. You, you're going to see adverse changes in blood pressure, adverse changes in lipids, adverse changes in transaminases. This is type 1 diabetes. The other data I showed you is type 2. So these are mechanism-based toxicities that I think are inescapable for us. And the other thing we know is that one dose of a glucagon receptor antagonist in humans increases GLP-1 and starts to change pancreatic biology. And if one is a human that has no glucagon receptor signaling, you get a big pancreas, you get many hyperplastic alpha cells, and some of them turn into pancreatic cancer. So try de-risking that with two-year toxicology at the Food and Drug Administration and let me know how it goes. So, you know, taken together, you know, the animal data is spectacular, all of the changes that we see with more GLP-1 and more GLP-2, and these are all beneficial kind of things, and they can be very exciting and, and help metabolically. But, you know, if, if I'm a human and I have a glucagon receptor antagonist and I have more GLP-1, it's a modest bowel growth factor. I have more GLP-2, it's a modest bowel growth factor. I put them together, guess what? They're additive because they work on different mechanisms. One works on crypt fission, one works on crypt proliferation, and I get more gut growth. And if I have a risk for uh, colon cancer in my family and so forth, this is not a mechanism that I would sign up for. So last thing, I, I won't talk about this, but Phil Scher, because of his physical proximity to the, the late, great Roger Unger has also been doing quite a bit of uh, glucagon receptor biology. And Phil has a, a very cool story examining what happens to the kidney. And I think there's almost nothing being presented on the kidney at this meeting. But I, I won't go over the story, it's really Phil's, but basically taking away the glucagon receptor from the kidney as if I didn't need another nail in the coffin for inhibiting glucagon receptor activity, but the kidney is very unhappy when you take away the glucagon receptor, and he has multiple models looking at this over time with multiple different experiments. So I think, you know, in, in summary, we're going to learn a lot more about many of these actions over the next uh, two days. I think the mechanisms are incompletely understood. There's a lot of room for great science. I, I do think there is a window for adding glucagon as a component of other uh, therapies to really get a greater metabolic benefit and whether the win will be 
on more body weight loss, whether the win will be uh, on the liver metabolically to get fat out of the liver to a greater extent than GLP-1, whether it will be perhaps beneficial for the kidney. Uh, you know, AstraZeneca has just done a clinical trial with their glucagon GLP-1 coagonist with many people who have kidney disease, and stay tuned for those results. So I think the next 100 years is still going to be very cool, but it's not going to be cool for glucagon receptor antagonists in the clinic, with regret. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions? We have a question down here. Please come, come with the microphone. Yeah, so I, the question was, uh, was, is there an antifibrotic effect of uh, glucagon in the liver? So the livers get much better when you do all the preclinical studies, livers gets much better. The humans who are getting these coagonists, as you know, are showing weight loss and reduced transaminase, reduced liver fat by uh, MRI. You know, there are molecules like PEMV dutide uh, in clinical trials for Naffold and Nash. So I, I think fibrosis is a tougher nut that takes longer to look at, so we don't have as much amazing data for fibrosis. Most of the data we have now for these coagonists is 12 to 16 weeks, and they're doing FIB4 scores and fibrosis biomarkers, but I think it's just too early to say whether or not there might be a fibrosis effect. Yeah, and yeah, thank you so much for the excellent talk, Dr. Drucker. I have a question um, regarding, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned GLP-2 and amino acid metabolism. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. So, you know, we, we know that glucagon will control amino acid flux, and particularly during a meal, it's dynamic. And also the, you know, glucagon receptor antagonists make uh, GLP-2 uh, going they go up from the gut. And GLP-2 will also promote amino acid absorption from the gut. So I'm just wondering if the reason we see this effect of glucagon and GLP-2 only during a meal and not during the fasting state is related to, you know, I, I don't have a good explanation to draw arrows, but I just wonder if it's related to this amino acid biology. Okay. Uh, we have a question down here. Christine is coming down with the microphone. You can talk without a microphone. I can shout. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, maybe it's a general question to the entire audience, but I mean, of course, the single cell RNA seq is very powerful, and but where there are glaring discrepancies between the physiology, or I mean, we know that glucagon works on on heart, and the single cell RNA seq data, shouldn't we worry a, li a little bit about that? I mean, there's a problem with the single cell RNA seq is that it only detects, I mean, the things that are lowly expressed will not be detected. And therefore, I mean, and, and then I, thi I think, we, and I think there's a risk these days that we regard single cell RNA seq as the gold standard and that we will actually miss some interesting biology. And, and, uh, and uh, for example, in the heart, uh, as an electrophysiologist, we know that the heart cells, like alpha cells, incidentally, they have to be active all the time. And they, they achieve this by using or expressing channels, proteins at very low density. But that's enough. And so I'm just... Yeah. So let me, let me answer... Yeah. Yeah. So you said a number of, of very uh, appropriate things. So single-cell RNA-seq by itself will miss genes and proteins, receptors expressed, particularly class B receptors at very low levels, 100%. So you can't rely on that and say, I don't see it by single RNA-seq, therefore it's not there. You're, you're absolutely right. If you notice, what I showed you is two complementary bits of data. One, where we did PCR on like 20 ventricular samples, and that's much more sensitive than single RNA-seq there was no receptor. And then I showed the single cell RNA-seq as just a complementary analysis to say, and even the people who
who are doing single cell RNA-seq, when they're looking at hundreds of thousands of cells, they don't see it either. But, but you are right, there are numerous examples of uh, single cell RNA-seq not showing your gene of interest at very low reads, but you know it's there functionally. So I think one, I agree with you, you have to be very careful, but the adipocyte story is the same. We don't see these receptors by PCR. We cannot reduce their levels using genetics, and it's not there by RNA-seq. So when you use multiple techniques that all converge on the same answer, you're in a better place scientifically. We have uh, time for a final question. Over here. Uh, that was a great presentation, and you really provided some uh, great uh, um, a convincing argument about the glucagon receptor antagonism and the pitfalls of that. Um, do you think, um, in parallel to that, if you inhibited um, enzymes that are part of the gluconeogenic cascade, so essentially downstream of glucagon receptor agonism itself, would it recapitulate the effects of glucagon receptor knockouts? Yeah, so I, I think it depends how far downstream you go. So, you know, Lee Weinstein at the NIH has already done some of this and started taking out GS, uh, GS alpha in the liver, so G proteins downstream receptor, and he recapitulates almost everything. So I think, you know, the question is where, how far downstream do you stop the initiation of that tremendous feedback loop that changes the amino acids and the alpha cells and everything else? So I don't think we know that yet. So I would say the answer to your question is maybe, but so far when people have started to go downstream and take out elements, they recapitulate the whole package.